But what did happen is that what really came across strongly to me is that um, those kind of uh, supportive situation, our collective, have proven themselves to um, completely hold the space during this crisis. So I think people who generally live in, for whatever reason, whether they live on the periphery or whether they live through, you know, um, post-trauma or whether they're precarious, for whatever reason, if people live in that survival, on that edge between surviving and thriving, and they have tools and things in place that they're kind of um, prepared for what happened. And I think other people found themselves unprepared. Um, and, um, and I wrote a kind of a long poem about that. I think it was the first week in, or second week in March, second week of the lockdown, where it was quite, everything was um, a bit sort of shocking. It was a shock to the system completely. Um, it felt almost like something like a war started or something. It was very unclear. And I wrote this a long poem um, about how I've been preparing for this my whole life. And I think in a collective sense, a lot of people have been um, mm -hmm. in different way. And, and by having the support structure through different forms of collective collectiveness, um, I think they proved to be ex extremely like life-saving and hope helpful and and I've noticed that over this year those collective structures have just grown and grown it became global and people joining in because it's online and you know so it, it in that way it's been incredible um, to see how that's been helpful as well as individual friendships but I think individual friendships been really in different way been tested in so many ways because um also because of changing rules with the government so some, in the beginning you could even meet somebody even if you left on because i live on my own so it was all all that and then every time you know it was quite funny how all that how the idea of somebody lives on their own was addressed in a way and um and that's hugely important but I think the yeah definitely the collective for me has kind of came through really profoundly through this period. Mm. It's kind of interesting because that that what you're saying is that there was a certain realization about the power of the collective but yet you were re-examining your individual existence um, in a kind of physical sense. Yeah, yeah, in a sense. Um, yeah, in different way, because it's always in relation to space. And because, you know, because space has been questioned so much, because everything became really about the one walk you can take a day. So suddenly, I started going to the same park every day. And before, I didn't even go to that park. I didn't I never even thought about that part. Can I start going every day, every day? And I've discovered a whole world there. And I've discovered a collective there of people who go there every day and have been going there every day for years. Um, and the dogs, for example, and then that's a kind of, that suddenly became a new local collective. And yet, yeah, individually, um, there's certainly that sense of how we move through space, how we move through, yeah, virtual space to teaching space to the park, the supermarket, meeting a friend, and all this tension around friends who, um, you know, in in my case, it's kind of who's in your bubble. So you have to, it has to be friends who adhere to the same level of. Um, taking measures but you can have a very close friend but they feel different they're like I have a friend who was just kind of well I'm not wearing a mask I'm just going to look after my immunity and look after after people other people I'm going to be strong in myself so I can help other people 
um, who are sick and, and they have been doing that completely, but they don't wear masks or keep distance. So, so that, that friendship is suddenly on an individual level, it's been tested, but also more subtly because with people who you meet uh, when we in between lockdowns when we can meet a bit more people and you kind of you each kind of like check each other out like how safe are you you know like how much are you telling me how much I found all these areas fascinating but painful as well mm. it looks like there's been a whole new um almost like a belief system imposed onto us I think that's an interesting point that you're making that you're making about kind of not quite directly asking what our kind of individual um, views are on things or is it okay if we hug is it not okay maybe we, we do stay apart and I think that there's something that your work's always been concerned with, or at least from my perspective, having observed it over, over the years, is in some sense, the belief system as a form of, I guess, social being or social existing. And so, It may not be anything to do with COVID or, but I'm trying to think about how, how is that notion of belief being challenged or how is it being changed? Mm. So it's, it's, it's definitely complicated. And also I think we're so in the middle of it. It's, it's very hard to kind of have uh, a sort of an overview or even sideway looking at it it's we so much in the middle of it but I just remember the last thing I did socially um, before the the first lockdown was to go to the Tate to Tate Modern to see Charlotte Porter um, screening and it was a full auditor auditorium probably 250 people and it, it was the first time when people were a bit kind of oh I'm hugging you and I'm not hugging you and I met an artist there and um, interestingly it's in, it is an artist that works with communities and collectives and kind of um, he said oh forget all that let's just hug uh, something like that and we, we, we had this big hug and and then later on as time went by and I reflected on it I kind of thought it's really interesting because the immediate response is, and I was the same, the immediate response was kind of like, oh, they, they, they just want to separate us. They don't want us to touch each other. And, but, but as soon as it become clear, became clear what's going on, then it was like the opposite. We have to protect each other by keeping a distance. And um, so what seemed like a collective act of resistance then actually was turned on his head because, and I think that's one of the biggest, perhaps the most difficult things about this. And I'm not saying this is the most difficult thing that ever happened to anyone because, you know, a lot of people have been through a lot of very difficult things in their lives. But I'm just saying that mostly whatever people's been through, whatever crisis we've been through, we were still able to do it together. I mean, even if people, um, stuck in the detention center they're there together and I mean now they still are just with, with the virus but but th that kind of form of resistance where we are meant to not share the space or share it with a certain distance so the idea of collectivity with a distance is I think it's quite um it's overwhelming and that will take time to really understand and people like managed amazingly in terms of still protesting. And like I said, there's still tons of collective support being offered um, by collectives online. And there's all sorts of ways of, there's mm -hmm. always ways of resisting, but I think that kind of, um, yeah, that, that definitely that sort of aspect of 
whatever it is that we're resisting, we need to do it with minimum this stuff two meters distance. It's something quite sort of um, mind, kind of mind boggling. Do you think this might be, I think it's, an, uh, you said, you feel like you've been preparing for this your whole life. So do you think this is a real maybe defining moment in, can you recognize a certain shift in, in your consciousness in relationship to what you have to say, what you have to do? Yeah, it has been for me. I actually made a major shift in my life, yeah. Um, I, I kind of, yeah, some, I, I took actual steps and actual actions and, and, um, and felt um, a real shift in, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm sort of based in London and I've been here for a very long time and I kind of, decided to set up a studio somewhere in, in, in nature and but also a place where a lot of people can come to and other people can use and I mean and it's it needs a lot of work it's it's kind of it's a project really um but yeah in, in a sense it's been um it's literally just, I, I didn't really plan it. It's literally happened uh, during this period. It's just, I kind of just did it and I'm kind of processing it. And um, so, so yeah, that's one shift that happened and that's to do with, um, yeah, like touching the ground. Yes, a physical environment as well. Being in a physical environment and being and being kind of, um, and because I live in the fifth floor, and maybe it's, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but I, I don't think, the, I think we have a long way to go. And I think because the, the planet is so out of um, balance that it's not the, you know, it's not the last of it. I think it's just the beginning of, it. I think we're entering a new phase. And I think the idea of kind of being locked again in the, on the fifth floor, for another period was just kind of okay um i think that's when my survival instincts just kicked in and um and i was just kind of um thinking yeah i need an escape and i need but also a place that people can come to much more easily and be part of and so so yeah that was one thing but during this period um i'm a hermit so but I'm in the center of the metropolis, you know, but then I'm moving, I'm not moving, I'm, you know, I'm kind of setting my, myself in a, in a studio somewhere far away, but actually there is a sense of openness because yeah. I'm on the ground and because people can come and because um, there's nature, there's a lot of nature. And um, so that sort of, um, and my whole identity of myself, I think for so many people, for what, you know, minority people for, you know, racial or sexual or gendered minority, the metropolis is the place, you know, that's, that's where you are, um, if you are there, if you're different. So to move to a place, especially the, you know, the, in the English countryside to kind of dare to kind of again puncture that different space um was a real shift of social consciousness. and political completely wow. yeah and real shift of kind of consciousness and um but also super exciting you know so but that might be a general that might be a general uh something that you may be doing as an individual but it might be that this is actually going to happen on a greater scale Oh yeah, it's happening on a greater scale on many levels. I mean, uh, you know, si people are simply literally moving, uh, you know, uh, like you have. Um, but also, these these are real. I mean, not not just 
since the pandemic, but more so since the pandemic, there's a real uh, movement around uh, the land and around um, the comments, you know, how sort of, um, I mean, it's always been the, the sense of land ownership, but it, it suddenly becomes, um, you know, the claim that, that we have for space has really heightened, I think, through, and, and, and it just makes you think of all this sci-fi film where, you know, when things are really bad and then somebody, just the rich people have that kind of access to this utopian place, which is like, let's say the countryside with this fresh air and, and behind left all the, you know, millions of sick people that can't afford it. And so I think all that, all those kind of sci-fi scenarios around space becomes so heightened now. And, um, mm -hmm. but also, also for kind of restoration, you know, we, I think on, on a level with, with what's been going on, because for me, the, the virus is completely kind of environmental. So anything that happened with that is sort of, um, there's a sense of healing and fixing. And, and for me, it can happen in different ways, but, you know, you can go to, I can go to a, a food bank in Hackney or in Camden and do it, or I can go and just feel like I need to understand my connection to the ground and the earth and just really um, feel it. So that's been happening. I don't know what kind of place you move into. Moving into a nice um, ground floor flat in a muse house, um, which actually feels very villagey because um, it's a muse in Belsize Park. So it has a feel of a, and it's a ground floor. It mm -hmm. used to be a stables, right? It yeah. used to be, you, you'd have horses on the ground floor. So it's, you've got those big garage doors at the front mm -hmm. that can now open and there is a glass so you can see kind of through and there is a sense of openness um i mean it's something that is just kind of right now possible and it's an it was an opportunity that i couldn't miss in a sense but um um but i i completely see the the kind of new um relationship to the countryside that we may be embarking on to Mm. Um, you know, I think this kind of uh, new awareness that the open space is the safe space, which I don't know if that was, the, the, I think previously might, that might not be the conception that we had. It was like hide from the world to be safe. That, mm -hmm. that was more of a kind of instinct. But now is get out in the as open, as free as kind of airy space to be safe. Mm. Um, the, actually the space gives us the, the distance gives us the safety rather mm. than the closeness, which is a change in thinking. Um, Completely, I think, you know, cities are hugely important and London is, you know, it, it is my home and it will, you know, I imagine always be my home. But I think as, a, as such an urban person to even consider that I might kind of, you know, take a train ride and go somewhere that is completely rural, for me, is definitely been instigated by, I mean, it, it's been on my mind as a fantasy for a long time, because for a long time, I felt like I've kind of done it, I've done the clubs, I've done the, you know, I've done London in some ways, you know, um, but not in terms of other things like, you know, I mean, London is amazing, but, um, and all my friends are here, but kind of in like my community, but in terms of, um, yeah, just to kind of, and, and also in terms of my practice to kind of what happens when, um, yeah, when it, it happens. change environment. Yeah. Because this isn't the first time you change environment. I mean, you you were born in Jerusalem. Exactly, yeah. It, it feels kind of really similar in, on that scale. I mean, the move from Jerusalem, I moved to Leicester, was um, quite, yeah, um, felt like, well, that was a huge change. 
and then even you know then moving to London and then but even moving from teaching in Goldsmiths to Oxford was a very big change yeah it's it's sort of I, the sort of all like sort of planet and there are some planets where you feel like you're like visiting and you're an alien and then there are some planets that you exactly like everyone else and and I think both are important you know it's important mm -hmm. to feel like you're on a planet where you part of everyone or where you're visiting somewhere that is you're totally an alien there's something else in the move I mean in the move you also get to look back mm. and so how it affects your work or how it affects your relationship to the place that you left. You know, in a sense, Jerusalem became your subject, or maybe not Jerusalem as a city, but the kind of cultural life became the subject of your work. And I'm wondering, would it be the subject of your work if you were there? Would you be able to have that kind of distance? Uh, was it the distance that allowed you mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I've just kind of started to think about it a lot about Jerusalem and about, um, well, the idea of Jerusalem, which is a sort of, in, in some ways, the idea of utopia. Jerusalem also being called um, the center of the world. There's many kind of, you know, what it stands for. And, and just recently there's been this song uh, Jerusalem, but it is a South African DJ, the whole world is dancing to it. And it's a kind of, um, it's a concept as well. And uh, Jerusalem, and um, recently I've been reading and thinking a lot about uh, William Blake's Jerusalem and the, the idea of, and that was partly um, the attraction about the studio is kind of to try and build Jerusalem in a kind of, in the green, kind of past posture, pastures of the green hills of England, you know, and to, so that question is, is very pertinent about the distance and, and that sense of, um, which I've just, just started to think about. I mean, I've been always thinking about it, but in terms of belonging, but, but that thought of the sense of rebuilding Jerusalem and trying to you know, which also connect to my politics around um, the occupation and that. Do you think, have you ever tried, have you ever attempted building Jerusalem in London? So I think, I think every immigrant does that. I think every immigrant and every immigrant community does that they try to build their own Jerusalem and I've seen it over and over again like I've seen it when I was kind of running classes in my local community center I've seen uh, groups of Bengali women kind of trying to create through food or through um, just hanging out together kind of creating their own Kind of recreating it's like a post-colonial condition or a colonial condition uh, and you see it in different parts of london which i love you go to different parts and you literally you can follow the empire you know and and see what it is and um and in london i think um not in the sense perhaps that not in a sense that you know some people may be would celebrate Jewish holidays with Israeli friends or not never in really not never in that way as such but um yeah I need to think about it more but um yeah um I guess when it comes to moving to the countryside maybe um thinking or oh, what is it what is it is it the spirit or is it the or is it just the memories? I think it's to do with, yeah, I mean... I've a been kind of certain to... kind of consciousness, maybe. Yeah, I've been reading, because um, my dad passed away and then 
I've discovered like one of my cousins gave me this document that um, his, my dad's sister wrote and he describes the childhood in Jerusalem in great detail. And, um, and they lived basically, um, it was rural, Jerusalem was rural. So, so they moved from outside the walls. They lived in the Muslim quarter for a long time. They moved outside of the Muslim quarter and just lived in a house with um, no amenities at all, like no water, electricity, nothing. All the animals were in the house with them. There were no room dividers. There was like kind of a very particular existence. And when I was talking to some of the people where I, I've moved, where I kind of planning to have my studio, they were saying, oh yeah, here my mum was raised with sheep and pig in the house. So we're like, so I think on that kind of um, slightly pre-modern um, sense, there is some some sort of maybe a parallel, that kind of idea of rebuilding Jerusalem in that way. Um, and also, I guess for me, it's never really an option because of the, because of the, the national issue, you know, because of you know the occupation and all that, and and then England obviously is, is steeped on all those kind of um, issues of nationalism. But because, in a sense, I wasn't born here, I'm a post-colonial subject. Then I feel like I can kind of insert myself into that without being the without being the settler in a way. And without sort of also the artist settler that kind of gentrifies kind of poor areas in, in London or in other cities. And so, um, yeah, all, all, all of that is sort of swirling around in my head. Yes, there is one thing that we associate with um, Jerusalem and that perhaps is also visible in your work, and that is the orthodoxy of it and orthodoxy being I don't, I don't know if it is a kind of constraint or if it is a construct that um, prevents certain liberties or um, not and I don't mean liberties in a kind of physical sense that you might probably do that but liberties in a kind of uh, spiritual sense uh, or in a kind of uh, openness and you've always challenged or worked with those notions and though they may be oppressive they seem to be the subject through which you're able to explore certain things mm. and I'm wondering whether maybe reconstructing Jerusalem in the English countryside, maybe about uh, coming to terms with orthodoxies of that particular place in order to respond to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think you're kind of disarmingly asking extremely deep questions that I'm very like um, in the middle. So I have, I'm having a bit of an out of body experience because you're kind of asking things that literally, they're almost- Are brewing. Brewing, <laughs> but in also in a very unconscious way. So a lot of it, you kind of bring this stuff up to, you know, it's like coming, climbing up to my consciousness from very deep inside. But, um, but if to take what you're saying, I guess um, some of these feelings I've had when I kind of start teaching in Oxford as well, and because there's certain orthodoxies and mythologies that are attached to. Oxford and I guess with orthodoxy for me for a long time it was a almost like a fetish there's some a fetish of something that is sort of um, 
you know, um, other uniformed, structured, um, unreachable in a way, oppressive, and, and yeah, the kind of desire to, to sort of have a relationship with it, whatever that is, whether it's questioning it or kind of queering it or playing with it or all that kind of stuff. And, and with Oxford, I kind of started to feel that, that kind of, um, I remember bumping into somebody in, the, in London and he said, oh, I've heard you teaching in Oxford, you sold out, you know? So this kind of sense of, you know, um, for an immigrant to kind of be in the establishment, I think is very interesting. You know, um, the idea of social mobility and being part of the establishment from an immigrant perspective and kind of, um, and yeah, the orthodoxy of, of the establishment and the Englishness of it and the kind of 700 or whatever years of, and, and, and the Jewish history of, you know, Jews being expelled from Oxford for 400 years and the land's been, cons 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 been confiscated. Taken. Exactly, yeah. been taken away, and um, so sort of it's interesting being there, so kind of walking on that history and being being in that history, and and yeah, and when I, I kind of in the very few visits I had to the countryside, when this idea of this um, future studio came up to me, um, I was kind of thinking, what happened here historically, you know? I mean, how many witches have been burnt and um, what, what you, you just feel that, you know, you feel um, that burden and that history for sure. And that in that sense that Jerusalem has that historical weight that, that you just know that if you went back in time, it will be quite horrific as well. Um, and, and, and then on, and then there's all this beauty, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, Jerusalem is beautiful as well. And, and it's yeah, it's interesting with Blake that that sort of and um, that resonance between between the two places that kind of almost teased me into sort of tracing that rebuilding and and also kind of unburdening myself from the Jerusalem of of well of you know the occupation and then coming into. But then, you know, coming into the sort of the Greenland of the empire at the same time. So it, it's it's almost like, you know, there's no really, there's no escape from colonialism. It's just where I'm situated in relation to it. And this is a different orientation. So, which is perhaps easier because um, I think in recent years, since my dad passed away, I definitely had uncontrollable desire to go back to my roots as such so I was thinking of going back and, and being you know going back to Jerusalem and um and I think I had, when were you last there um September I want yeah to see my mom this yeah, in the middle of everything yeah it was crazy I mean it was really crazy the whole you know it was the, the height of the lockdown, all the Jewish holiday, everything kind of mixed together, um, and some kind of and some kind of unbelievable situations um, that were going on there around well um, around Orthodoxy and Orthodox groups that that they refuse to wear the mask or take the vaccine that they kind of think that. Um, you know, uh, whatever God intended for them, then, you know, whatever will happen will happen. And then, um, yeah, talking about belief system, and then that met with the belief system of people who want to protect themselves and other, and in this, and in, in that neighborhood where I was brought up and where my mum is in a care home, there like real clashes, like physical, and I was part of that. I was like, um, like losing the plot on occasions and like really finding myself shouting and screaming, you know? Um, 
it's it was very intense that kind of encounter. And you made it work actually. Mm. You made it work while there. Oh, do you mean the one for Kettle's Yard? You, you did a film of of the oh. through through the window of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was before. That was before the. Yeah, that was before the. Um, or was that before the? That wasn't twenty twenty. That was early. That was just just before the pandemic. Yeah, oh, I nice. made a short film. Um, since the pandemic, I made a, a very like three minutes film for Kettle's Yard, and 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 that yeah that has footage from um, from Jerusalem and um, in a moment, but yeah, it, it was sort of. Um, yeah, he was sort of like going to the care home and, you know, my mum sits outside and she's a bit like Trump, like she would never wear the mask. And and then groups of um, Orthodox Jews came, just not supposed to, but they just came and prayed again without masks. And so all my instincts of protecting her were just like, what are you doing here? Why why are you come into this kind of care home to to, you know, to pray without you know, without masks and, and then being so at the same time ashamed of myself that I'm kind of, you know, that it's sort of, I'm, I'm kind of being um, policing them. And, and that's the other results of this because suddenly, like it or not, we're totally accountable for each other. So, you know, while usually I'd respect whatever they choose to do to, you know, um, on, on the kind of, in terms of you know whatever my freedom has been infringed by them but in terms of um of that because of the instincts of survival when i see that the, it threatens my mom's life it was yeah. like i i just it was like a complete scene I, I just lost the plot completely and it was very dramatic and uh yeah and afterwards i was like what was that but i think that we do it does happen now in, because we are in like a pressure cooker. Yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting thought because we are in a position to really protect life, and we are pr trying to protect life. And I think when the stakes are so high, your relationship with orthodoxy maybe changes, and that might be one of the things that resulted from this. Is that? I mean, my question was going to be, what is your relationship to orthodoxy? Are you a do you criticize it? And you may have said not, maybe a year ago, but maybe now that's different. So is it different? <laughs> it's, just, it's weird that you're asking me all these questions. It's, it's, I never get to talk about it, but they're the most kind of important things that go in my head, so it's, it's like, you're in my head it's kind of weird um i don't mean it in a kind Are, of is it okay though yeah i don't mean like conspiracy theory way but i'm like how does he know all this stuff um because i i don't really yeah i don't kind of talk about it much but um it's just from looking at your work really interesting really really interesting um i just think that it's all just kind of for me but because i i really don't talk about this stuff in in um, so, yeah, since really the pandemic, because everything's been thrown, you know, everything's been thrown out in so many directions and because exactly of the question you're asking. So yeah, before, if I'll be in Israel and I have friends who are kind of open-minded, lefty friends, they, they, they really, um, they have real issues with, I'd, I'd say as far as almost racism against Orthodox Jews, you know, uh, it's really polarized. And um, I never kind of had that. I've always had fascination and um, curiosity. And then I think a lot of kind of people in Israel say, well, you don't live here. You don't live with that. So you, for you, it's just kind of exotic, but you don't have to live with the restrictions that are imposed on us. And you don't have to live with um, that they don't go to the army, they don't pay tax and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're a different fraction, obviously, of orthodoxy. So I'm, I'm referring to, you know, certain groups. And obviously for me, it suits my anti-Zionist sentiments that they don't, you know, they don't go to the army and that. Um, 
so yeah, if you ask me before, I would probably say, um, you know, um, that, that it's kind of my heritage. They're not they're not my people now, but um, I'm open, you know. But now um, it's just another side of the brain that kicks in, and I think it's 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 sort of there. It's it's the really old reptilian, you know. It's a real survival stuff. It's like you know, it's how we've been created, you know, um, God knows how long ago. And and um, some of the leading rabbis are literally telling people not to wear masks and not to take the vaccine. And a lot of people are dying and a lot of people are ill. And a lot of it is also very close to my, me, my family, you know, a lot of, and you know, uh, my extended family, that are part of it um, because some of my family are very extreme right wing orthodox and um, who yeah they will never wear masks and will never take vaccine you know but but then they'll do something like they'll they'll ask the carer or the, or the the person to look after somebody in the family to come and be part of that so then somebody else gets infected and that's when it becomes kind of suddenly something else kicks in and um and my god eh, that's tough so yeah if you ask me now it's it's very hard to speak about it mm. because your work has always been provocative of mm. it but there was a certain kind of understanding within it yeah yeah and i feel like now there are that particular sec section of it, of um, that particular orthodox section, is a lot more pr provocative than my work. It's 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 sort of I find it very provocative that they um, it's their belief system, but it's sort of <laughs> and yeah, it just oh, I've been doing so many shameful things along those lines because when I was flying to Israel. Um, it was hardly anyone, but there were a number of auto, like London Orthodox Jews, and again that they're not wearing, they're not putting the masks, and and again I found myself doing things I never will do. I just walked to each one of them and kind of kind of shamed them, and I just said, well, you know, you've got God on your side, great, and you feel okay with whatever happens, but I don't want to get it, and. I don't have your gold, so you know, put your mask on and and I literally went to each person and on, you know, in the waiting lounge and <laughs> um that was that yeah, that previously would never be my relationship to to Orthodox Jews and 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 kind of shamefully they all put the masks on because you know um, British Orthodox Jews are very characteristically gentle and they just they didn't bite they just kind of put it back and um, um but i did the same in one train journey that i had and it was just this kind of um in england this kind of nondescript white couple not wearing a mask and i went and again had this kind of a bit of um, um what i call rage attack is probably <laughs> probably kind of extremely mm -hmm. mild kind of um protest and and they just left the cabin and then that was fine with me but i think i think that's kind of different when it comes to this group of people that has this belief system and it comes from um something that i do fundamentally respect but then it clashes with my survival mechanism very mm. very primitive level um yeah, basically. What is, um, so you say you have a lot of family that are quite, uh, mm. well, I think something that this has done to all of us, it's that it's actually radicalized a discourse, mm. right? It's radicalized um, all sides. Um, and therefore us, wherever we are, we've become, I guess, a tiny bit more radical. Um, but then at the same time, I was I was reading about how radicalism has is almost this 
disappearing as well. It's a kind of funny duality because, you know, we have the, the rightist government in the UK in decades doing the most left-wing things one can imagine, obviously forced by the pandemic. Uh, you know, things like universal basic income through the furlough scheme or, mm. um, you know, all the other things. Uh, prohibitions of movement and um, so I think that's a kind of interesting thought how that kind of notions of radicalism are changing mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, yeah I don't know whether within your yeah whether within your work there was radicalism that you feel maybe accelerated <laughs> you do freak me out <laughs> um, are you yeah like i do feel like you're like a mind reader or something like a psychic i'm not you know <laughs> i'm really not you know i don't know um maybe i've been like quiet for too long um oh no yeah completely um i mean the new new work that i'm thinking about has that kind of yeah what you're saying about acceleration that kind of sense of um, wanting, in terms of radical, wanting the kind of meta and the meta of the meta, you know, just wanting to really come to the most kind of meta form of whatever resistance or means, whatever radicalism means, um, whatever equality means. Um, yeah, definitely feeling that. But at the same time, it's almost, for me, for, for this new work, and perhaps maybe it shows something bigger, there's a set, because when, when you go meta, then you become also kind of apolitical. And I think there's something around that as well, that perhaps there is an acceleration of radicalism that just takes us to the abstract and um, away yeah. from you know, into the, the apolitical or the philosophical or the poetic or the imaginary in a kind of um, unspecified way because it's it's not yet clear um, because it's it's such a mashup, yeah. I mean, I mean, that kind of collapse of the right and the left happened, um, at, you know, in the work I did, um, Party for Freedom in 2013, I was already talking about the kind of the, the far right takeover and the collapse of the left and um, and all of that, but um, I think the the, the sort of um, the polarities now um, are kind of the polarities like the new identity politics. It's it's beyond any uh, belief system and it's beyond any definitely beyond party politics it's beyond any kind of anything solid that one can actually hold to for meaning it's, it's almost kind of repolarizing and fragmenting um as a kind of uh, inertia you know and and it's it's full of hate and um mm -hmm. and and, you know, in, and, and that, and, you know, a lot of people saying that this is a result of sort of decades of identity politics. It's probably true to an extent. But again, I think it's to do with, um, it's a symptom of an illness of how, how we're treating, you know, of kind of accelerated capitalism, basically, and extraction. And um, that's what happens. Things just kind of, they, they don't cohere. They, they just, they don't integrate. They just start to. You know, they just literally fall apart and um, into fragments. And I think this is back to what you were saying about the collective. This is why it's important to uh, find places, to really find places where we can connect and find places where we can share something. And um, and it's not on the same maybe lines that we used to. Maybe it's not to do with you know what party we vote for or what our sexuality is maybe it's other things but that the, is just um i think it, it is really really important to find um points of solidarity mm. 
-hmm. that, that come out of difference rather than sameness, but nonetheless, that there is a sense of solidarity because, yeah, otherwise everything is just polarized, really. Mm. So there is one aspect of your work that I feel potentially maybe changing as a result, the kind of the kind of radical radicalism of it. And there is another thing, and that is the awareness of death. That we become hyper aware of death. Um, and your work's always been aware of death, and it's, it's kind of spoken about it. Yeah. I guess that's the new work is kind of looking at death from even a more meta kind of perspective. Um, and kind of really, really questioning in any way the, the binaries between life and death completely and really asking where liveness is and, and if liveness is really for me, liveness is located um, so firmly with where capitalism is, then um, then we have to look for other sort of other place, other other quiet places where where it's not clear, kind of you know, in the cycle of life and death, it's not quite clear where things are in this cycle, but where capitalism and technology, I mean, kind of um, technology that is um, motivated by acceleration and extraction. Um, more so than for medical research, but that kind of, that form is um, yeah areas of like um, you know genetics and, and and all those kind of areas of um, um, yeah creating life, extending life through through technology that I'm I'm kind of interested in now. Mm -hmm. I guess in uh, in during during the pandemic, um, death has been turned into statistics, right, into mm -hmm. algorithms, and which is I think in, it's interesting how you're actually taking that into the the realm of technology, which is which isn't something I was thinking about, but I think it's so poignant because you know, the government is always presenting these models of death, you know, the lines of death. It's mm. like, this is, this is how the death is gonna go around if we do this, that's how it's gonna do, that's what's gonna do if we do that. Um, and it's, pred it's predicting, right? It's a predictive thing. It's, it's, a, it's a computation and um, technology has allowed us to kind of look in advance and um and then also devoid death from the person you know from the mother from the father but it becomes a percentage mm. of population um yeah that, that is such an interesting thought uh, <laughs> Yeah, completely. Um, I think, yeah, I think the areas of technology where it equates with capitalism, where they just can't, and that's was like in revisiting Genesis, they can't leave anything alone. So, so they can't leave any kind of all the edges and the periphery of life and death are also kind of um, excavated, really, and um, mined and so I'm interested in that, but the the sort of um, the narrative that I'm kind of planning to work with is um, quite simple, kind of, but complicated around um, where you know that period when I was in Israel and my mom um, is in the care home and she uh, always was testing negative and had closest friend from next door was tested positive so they were not allowed to meet um, but at night they were sneaking into each other's room and and again that conflict that I was trying to describe 
so on the one hand, we, I was trying to describe the uh, belief system of a certain Orthodox Jewish communities, but in their belief system that they needed to be together to survive loneliness. So, so they had to be together. And then there's the kind of need to um, protect my mom from contracting it. So there were different kind of, uh, the, the care home used different things like the, the kind of put chairs against the door and they put like massive kind of posters on my mom's door. You're not allowed to visit your friend, things like this, but they, they didn't listen. And then in the end, my mom's carer said, well, I'm just going to watch the CCTV and I'm going to see what happened. And if, if you're lying to me, I can't come to work because I can't risk myself. And, and you can't also, you can't choose my, my mom's carer is amazing. And, um, and then, then we, we're getting into that whole area that I've been interested in for a long time. And it's the surveillance and intimate surveillance and how, um, especially around end of life surveillance, how, um, you know, um, very old people who stay home on their own, then the younger children watch them on CCTV to make sure they're okay. But also, you know, old people are watched for data extraction, you know, harvesting data. Um, I think there was something really beautiful that you said in that email that we first exchanged. And that was, uh, I, do, I do have it written down here. I have to confess that every day I have less to say and every day I doubt what I have to say more and more. And I mean, there is something so, um, well, there is, there is honesty in it, but there is also maybe, I'm just wondering whether there is a comment on an artist in a contemporary society as well, having to say things, having to explain things. And I hope this whole experience isn't too difficult for you. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly enjoying it, but um, yes. So that is my question um, about the artist and the need to speak and explain. Yeah, I think there is the, the human thing that we need to make sense of things, but then with artists, it's then become tied down to their kind of um, professional life because people ask artists to comment on, so, so, so people want to know, um, what's going to happen, like artists that can predict the future or artists can lead the future, or artists can define the present. Or, so I've done a few things for, for the radio recently uh, since the pandemic where I was asked about the, the future of art, uh, the future of art education during the pandemic. And, and I tried to answer it to the best of my abilities, but, um, and, and, and I kind of vaguely see people making work kind of the, under the kind of the umbrella of trying to make sense of the moment and understand it. And, um, and maybe at certain points in my life, I think that's very personal to me. I felt like I, I had the answers um, and I really thought I did. And I thought I had a great conviction and that was mainly to do with my political engagement. And, but I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm personally, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not there in a sense that I can speak much to anything really. Um, is it because of you're losing conviction or is it because you're more open to things? No, oh, that's a really, that's a super question. Um, I 
I think I'm more open to things um, in a way. Um, I think I, I was more black and white when the world felt more black and white. And I think the world really doesn't at all now. And, and certain things are still completely clear. You know, it's clear that, you know, um, when, you know, people have been shot at because they're black, that's, that's very, very clear. Or where we have the occupation of Palestine and those ethnic cleansing, that's very, very clear. So this is not what I mean. I mean that, um, I mean that the kind of um, there is a way for me that I guess um, I, I just don't anymore can see things in a black and white way um, mm. at all, and um, and yeah, at some point I thought that it was disillusionment with the political system and. Um, and the failure of the left and and there the is that I think that was the kind of process but I think um and it's going to sound really really cheesy but um it, it's where I'm at I think I was very very angry for years and I'm not it's not that I'm, I'm still I'm angry but I think there is a lot more sense of compassion and I think with compassion is sort of harder to um It's harder to speak to, for that to that or the other. It's harder to speak in and have that conviction. And I don't know. It, it's just, I've never thought I'd say that. It just sounds like a really weird thing to say, but it just what's come to my mind when when you're asking that because I think that's what's changed for me is that um, I think through the anger I went through a long period of mourning and loss. For, for personal things, but also for the world we live in, and and I think through through a lot of mourning and loss, also I came into compassion, and and I think with compassion um, and love, my investment is less about kind of knowing what to, knowing what to say or saying the right thing or knowing anything 